What will your future look like? The job you do today could be different than the jobs of tomorrow. Some see this as a challenge. At UCF, we see opportunity. A chance for you to grow your knowledge and strengthen your skills from anywhere life might take you. With in-demand degree programs and resources for your success, UCF Online can help you prepare for the future and all the possibilities that come with it. From the University of Central Florida's Center for Distributed Learning, I am Tom Cavanaugh. And I am Kelvin Thompson. And you are listening to TopCast, the teaching online podcast. Greetings, Kelvin Thompson. Greetings, Tom Cavanaugh. So, so glad you put in that, uh, the teaching online podcast, which is, you know, a step better than I did uh, in a previous episode where I left it out. Who's keeping score? Not me. me. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Tom. Yeah, so we are once again you know, sequestered away in our separate offices in our new mm -hmm. lovely building. Yeah. Um, so uh, I saw you, IRL, yeah. in real life. In real life. And mm -hmm. uh, you poured me a cup of lovely steaming hot joe. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I'm drinking out of my uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Association of Chief Academic Officers Digital Fellows Program mug. Hoi polloi. Quite yeah, nice. hoi polloi, actually, yes. Uh, I, I have uh, my up mug, see? Oh, up mug, that's good. Yeah, yeah it, um, Casey Green, who you know helped coordinate that for the foundation mm -hmm. when, he, when he handed out the mugs at the end of that Digital Fellows Program. It's like, well, depending who you are in a room with, you may want to reverse how you hold it to show which side, who you're trying to impress or hide your affiliation from. Uh, that, was, that was pretty funny on Casey's part. Yeah, that's, 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 that seems uh, Casey humor to me, yeah. <laughs> yep. So, Calvin, Tom. what was in your thermos? What am I drinking? Uh, so, Tom, today's coffee is a single origin, back to the single origin, uh, coffee from Kenya. It's a Kenya Kirinyaga Key. I think is the way you do the the, the last part of that. Key, uh, Kirinyaga is a county, and Key is like the, the place where they make the coffee. Uh, from Novo Coffee in Denver, Colorado, the tasting notes from the roaster include comments that this coffee is, quote, deeply expressive, unquote, with a, quote, rich, dark sweetness, unquote, along with particular flavor notes that one might discern. Now, see, I'm always fascinated by the metaphorical language that coffee enthusiasts use to describe coffees. It kind of reminds me of when I was an undergrad vocal student. Everything was metaphor and emotion in order to get a desired vocal effect. So how's the coffee? And could you find a connection with today's episode? Well, I like the coffee. I've had just a bit of it so far, but it's mm -hmm. good as always. You always mm -hmm. pick good coffees. Thank you. Thank I'm going to take one little sip while I contemplate your connection. <laughs> Notice I, I didn't say, how was the connection? I said, did you find one? <laughs> I did. I did. Um, <laughs> because uh, I know what we're talking about today. That always helps. It does help. And, um, and, and you, you, you stretched it pretty thin, but you made that, you made that connection. You found that tenuous <laughs> line between the things. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So today we are talking about the voice, about yes. vocal tonality mm -hmm. about kind of vocal hygiene mm -hmm. so you talked about uh being expressive mm -hmm. you talked mm -hmm. about being an undergraduate vocal student so mm -hmm. it sort of like hit me on the head with it a little hard hey well um do what we can yeah and getting that desired vocal effect mm -hmm. um so i could see that and there's mm -hmm. a what did you say? A rich, dark sweetness, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. not how I would describe my voice, but, um, <laughs> but maybe others. You're a little more baritone than I. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, but gotcha. yeah, so uh, so that I think the connection is a it's a solid B minus. Ooh, that's yeah. that's one of my better ones, as yeah. it turns out. Well, I'm grading on a curve here. <laughs> well, that's nice, yeah. and you know, uh, it, it takes it takes end points to to get a to get an average, Tom. So, you know, <laughs> so you're going to have some highs, you're going to have some lows. That's that's how it is. Um, so about today's episode, we comment periodically that Topcast has this sort of this three strand audience of faculty and instructional designers and leaders or administrators, and we try to be relevant to all three dimensions all the time. But we do tilt sometimes uh, to uh, one particular 
uh, audience strand, and today's episode is centered squarely on listeners who are members of the teaching faculty. However, we hope that instructional designers or administrators will certainly pass along insights to faculty colleagues. So specifically, quite literally, in this episode, we're going to be speaking about the voice of our faculty. And we thought this focus might be appropriate, particularly as we're all poised to start our fall terms, the new academic term as, as this episode will release the fall 2020. So um, that's what we're going to be focused on. Yeah. And in order to help us focus on this, Kelvin, recently you interviewed Dr. Richard Zrake, mm -hmm. uh, who um, is a, a professor here at UCF. Mm -hmm. um, and um, talked to him remotely since we've mm -hmm. been in this sort of remote environment. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he's a, he's a good colleague and mm -hmm. somebody who's interested in uh, the online space, but also had some particular expertise to offer us. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about, about uh, Richard's background. Sure. And Richard uh, has convinced me that he is a top cast listener, you know, not just, not just, you know, I listened for five seconds and said, uh, yeah, but uh, he, he actually does listen, which is which No, he, is quite he generous. sent me notes about episodes that he's yeah, listened to in the past. I like that. I appreciate that. That's, yeah. that's wonderful. So as you say, Tom, Dr. Richard Zrake holds the rank of professor in the School of Communication Sciences and Disorders in the College of Health Professions and Sciences here at UCF. He is formerly the school's founding director. Dr. Zrake is a certified speech language pathologist with over 30 years experience treating patients with disorders and coaching professional voice users. So who better to talk to us about faculty voice going into the fall term? Yeah, and I think this is a, a, a very timely topic to talk about as everybody's sort of on Zoom all day long and people mm -hmm, are, are teaching mm -hmm, in different mm -hmm, ways and we're going to have to be, those of us who are on campus, be teaching through masks. And it it, it is creating... Uh, strain on a strain on the voice that maybe we hadn't previously mm -hmm. thought, and so uh, I think this is a really interesting, interesting topic to discuss. So, mm -hmm. Kelvin, any comments you wanna you wanna make uh, before we go to the interview with uh, Dr. Richard Zrake? I think the only thing I'd say is I think this is kind of a good companion piece to our preceding episode, uh, episode seventy one, finding flexibility for face to face this this fall about the blend flex approach, just because. You know, we talk there about kind of this combination of online and face-to-face, -face, and Richard talks about this combination of online and face-to-face -face voice usage, you know, and they're, they're, it's different kind of usage and different kinds of um, misuse and so forth. So I think it, it makes a nice companion piece to that other episode. Okay. Well, through the magic of podcast time travel, let's now listen to your interview with Richard. Hey, Richard, so glad you could join us for TopCast. Glad to have you here with us. Thank you. Glad to be here. So you and Tom and I have been talking in uh, recent days about the fact that with the global pandemic, there's so much in flux in higher education teaching, teaching methods, modalities, and so forth. But something that's almost a constant is the fact that the instructor's voice is in use almost all the time across those various methodologies and modalities. And as a, as a professional in this area, it was very generous of you to be willing to come and kind of give us some pro tips for how to make the best uh, of faculty voices, uh, regardless of how, what else is changing around us. So, so can you kind of lead us down a path here that would be useful for our listeners? Absolutely. I think this is a really timely topic. Um, I think the thing that's important to think about is for those of us that are in academia and that are teaching, it's not just that we're using our voice to be teaching our classes during the day, but there's really an increased voice demand just throughout the day for other aspects of our job. We're all doing Zoom meetings with faculty, with colleagues, with students, with other people. So we're using our voice a lot throughout the day and we're using it mostly through teleconferencing, which is not something that we're ever used to doing for the most part. So there's the demand of using it during teaching, but then there's the added demand of using the voice during the other times of the day, also through Zoom. And that creates a whole nother level of demand on the voice. And for some people, it can be difficult to keep up with that demand. Yeah. That makes some sense uh, for me. As you and I have talked about, I, I actually once upon a time knew a little bit about voice and vocal production as a as an undergrad music major. But um, can you kind of walk us through? I mean, I think there's a lot people don't know about even vocal production and what can go wrong. 
Sure, happy to do that. I think that's a very important part of educating people about how to prevent voice disorders is just to know how the voice is produced to begin with. So in the simplest terms, we produce our voice by having air come out of our lungs and that air travels upward through our windpipe or trachea into our larynx. And larynx is what people commonly refer to as the voice box. And within the larynx, we have vocal folds and sometimes they're called vocal cords, but those are muscles. They're very tiny muscles that are about the size of the clip of the cap of your ballpoint pen. So they're very small. They're about 20 millimeters long in an adult and about two millimeters wide. So they're very, very small, tiny muscles among the smallest muscles in the body. And when the air hits those vocal folds, they're set into vibration. So they start vibrating and they can vibrate very quickly. And when they vibrate, they produce a sound. And we call that the vocal tone. And then that tone travels up into our mouth and into our nose and comes out as voice, what we perceive as voice or speech. And so the thing to be thinking about throughout the process of producing voice is you have to have good airflow, you have to have good breathing, you have to be able to control that breathing as it goes through your larynx and sets those vocal folds into vibration. And you have to be able to project that tone out the front of your mouth so that it can be heard and it can project out to the people that are listening to it. And one of the things that I think people don't appreciate, but they're always fascinated by, is how fast the vocal folds vibrate. So for you and I as adult males, when I'm talking to you right now, my vocal folds are vibrating about 100 times per second. And if it was a, we were adult females, they would vibrate about 200 times per second. So when you think about how many seconds a day that your voice is on, you know, how many seconds are you using your voice? And you start multiplying that by 100 if you're a male or 200 if you're a female, you can start to appreciate the hundreds of thousands and sometimes up into a million vibrations a day of those tiny, tiny, tiny vocal folds. And so that's just normal voice use. That's the kind of voice that we're using right now. It's not, it doesn't even take into account singing um, or doing any other kind of exercises with our voice or using our voice in any other way. This is just our normal speaking voice my vocal folds are vibrating 100 times per second. That's awesome. So there are probably some differences in the way that an instructor would use her or his voice in a large classroom or even a medium-sized classroom versus uh, this kind of environment, like where we are. We're using a, a video conferencing platform as we record this interview, and uh, a lot of people are using those kinds of platforms right now, or pre-recording um, videos uh, or audio uh, narrated presentations or, or whatnot. I would imagine that the there are some differences to how voice is used and misused in those different contexts. Is that right? That's absolutely right. And the key word that you used there was environment. So the way I like to describe this to my patients is I like to tell them to think about two environments. There's the internal environment, which is their body and their mind. And then there's the external environment, which is the room that they're in. And so when we think about how we're gonna use our voice effectively and how we're gonna prevent ourselves from having a voice disorder, I always like to start with the internal environment. So what I mean by that is things like being rested, being hydrated, being physically calm, being emotionally and mentally calm and focused, all the kinds of things that would decrease uh, physical stress, emotional stress, psychological stress on the body. And that's the internal environment. And we have some control over that, but we're human. So um, as I tell my students, the voice is a window into the soul. And I think we all know when somebody doesn't quite sound like themselves, if you will. Um, we know when somebody sounds sick or stressed or tired or happy based on their voice. And a lot of that is controlled by the what I call internal environment. And so that's one thing that we have to be very cognizant of as speakers is our internal environment. The other thing we have to think a lot about is our external environment. And that's what you were referring to just a moment ago. The external environment are things like the classroom that we're in. So how large is the classroom? Uh, what materials are in the classroom? Is it carpeted? Uh, does it have high ceilings, low ceilings? Are there soft surfaces? Are there hard surfaces? Where are we in the classroom relative to the people that we're speaking to? Are they you know, six feet away from us or are they 60 feet away from us? What kind of noise is there? 
in the classroom? What kind of noise is there outside the classroom? And I've been thinking a lot about this myself personally, because in the fall, I'll be teaching a class face to face. And I have 70 students. And normally with a class that size, I'm in a classroom that holds about 80 students. So we're packed in and it's manageable. Now, because of the COVID era, I'm gonna be teaching 70 students in a classroom that holds 450 potentially. So they're gonna be spread out. I'm gonna be spread out far away from them. And so I really have to think about that environment, that physical environment of how am I going to connect with them? How are they gonna connect with me? And how are they gonna connect with each other? And one of the challenges with those environments is it's really difficult to connect when you're tethered to the lectern. You know, you're just standing there, kind of like a talking head, if you will, and we all fear that. It's nice to be able to move around. It's nice to be able to get our body moving, get our facial expressions going. You know, move closer to somebody if we're trying to emphasize a point that we're making. Um, have that connection from a proximity standpoint. And it's going to be difficult to do that now when we're all socially distancing. So we're dealing with that challenge within the environment of the classroom. And of course, the other challenge that we're dealing with is the masks. So as you know, at our institution, we're gonna be required to wear face masks. So the face masks really create, I think, a couple of potential problems for us. One is, I think everybody can understand, they're a barrier to the sound coming out of our mouth. We've all been walking around with face masks and going into the grocery store or going to the dry cleaner, wherever it is that we go. And we're talking and somebody's talking to us. And sometimes it's almost like a mumbling that we're hearing because the sound is being blocked by the face mask. And so the tendency is if we know that our voice is being blocked, we're going to tend to want to talk louder, like talk through the mask. And that potentially can create some problems just in terms of strain and fatigue and those kinds of things that will make it difficult for our voice to last throughout the day. So the masks create that barrier to the sound coming out. They also can affect how we breathe. And so if you think back to what I was saying earlier about how breath is what helps drive those vocal folds into vibration, it potentially can affect how those vocal folds vibrate as well because our breathing isn't as natural as it used to be because we have a mask on now. So those are the kinds of challenges that we're really facing in the classroom is, you know, the masks, we're dealing with the acoustics of the classroom, we're dealing with the proximity to each other in the classroom. And so these are all things, they're not insurmountable, but they're just barriers that we need to be aware of in the classroom. Any tips for overcoming those barriers in the classroom? Again, I've been thinking a lot about that for myself, so I'm gonna to try to practice what I'm preaching today. Uh, one of the things that I think is very important is to use a lapel microphone. I mean, a microphone period is important, but I prefer lapel microphones because the lapel microphone will allow you to walk around, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, there's some value to getting your whole body involved in voice production, um, not just standing there and just relying on the sound coming you know, out of your larynx into your mouth and out into the space. If you're moving around, you have more energy, you have all of your muscles involved, you're breathing a little more vigorously. All of these things can really help you to have a voice that's being projected by moving. Um, now, you don't want to be running you know, back and forth across the stage, if you will, while you're talking, but moving is better than just standing still. And so if you have a lapel mic, you're much more free to move around. You also will have some ability to move closer to the person that you're talking to or the group that you're talking to and still maintain social distancing, depending on how the room is set up. So I really like using lapel microphones uh, when you're giving a presentation in front of a large group or in a large room because it gets you engaged. It also keeps you more mentally engaged. Uh, people can focus on you. Um, it's a lot easier for the listener or the viewer to tune you out if you're just stationary and standing still. So movement is good for the voice. Now, uh, two, two questions. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, again, in the face-to-face -face environment. Um, one, I think not all of our teaching colleagues will have uh, access to a microphone uh, in their physical space. And, oh, my goodness, we've all either been the person or have known the person who've said, I don't need a microphone. I have an exceptional teacher voice. And they proceed to be very loud. And so one, um, 
tips, cautions on that non-technology amplified uh, being louder with your with your voice um, kind of usage. And two, as you know, there's a subset of of our course sections this fall uh, that will be nevertheless using um, uh, recording in our BlendFlex approach. And I imagine a lot of institutions, there will be something similar where by necessity, faculty are going to have to be a bit constrained behind uh, a lectern or uh, in front of uh, the camera and a document uh, camera and so forth, which will be will make it difficult to apply those principles you just gave us of, of movement and so forth. So I just gave you two Two curveballs uh, for the face-to-face -face environment. Any any workarounds for those? Sure. Let me step up to the plate and see how I do with those. So the first one... That was almost a sports metaphor. There you go. The first one relative to the person who thinks they can uh, succeed without a microphone. What I would say there is, in, in all likelihood, you probably can succeed for a short period of time. Okay. What's going to happen is that, you know, the physiology is going to win out. You can perhaps give a lecture for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe even an hour without a microphone. Um, and then you probably could be successful for that hour. But then you have to remember that the rest of the day you have to continue to talk. You're not just going back into a cave and, and isolating yourself. You're going to still be using your voice in other contexts. And so what happens is the cumulative effect of using the voice incorrectly is what's going to get you in the long run. And so the way that I try to explain this to people is, is think about voice conservation. Another way to think about it is a gas tank has a certain amount of gas in it. So if, if you think of the gas in the gas tank as your voice and you decide, you know, how far do you want to go on that tank of gas? Well, you know, you could put the pedal to the metal and go 120 miles an hour in your Mustang. And you're not going to go as far with that gas. But if you go 45 miles an hour in your minivan, you're going to go farther. And so the thing to be thinking about is you only have, theoretically, so much voice, if you will, that you're going to be able to use during the day. And you have to decide how you want to use that voice. And so if you're a person who's a social person who gets up and likes to talk to people and talk to your neighbors while you're doing your morning walk and you talk to your plants and you talk to your pets and you're coming into the office and you're on the phone driving in and, and that kind of personality, you're not going to be able to keep up with the demands. And so that voice overuse is one of the most common reasons that we see people come in for voice therapy is they're just using their voice to much. And so if there's ways to extend the use of the voice during the day, and the microphone is the ideal way to do that, then you can still live your life and not feel constrained, but use it in a reasonable way. And so it's all about a matter of moderation, like everything else, you know, use your voice in moderation. So that idea of voice conservation and moderate voice use uh, is really important to pre preserve the voice and prevent voice problems. So that's the first one. Um, the second issue you brought up was, what do you do when you're not in a face-to-face -face environment, like we're in right now, or we were all thrust in in the spring? So a couple of things to think about with the, the sort of the, the online lecture, if you will. Uh, one of the things to think about is, again, the internal environment. So let's go back to that. If you think about the internal environment, um, you want to be somebody who comes to that recording or that lecture, awake, alert, and with a little bit of physical energy. So one of the things that I do is I usually will go take a walk around the block right before I'm ready to give my lecture that evening. It takes me about 15 minutes and it just gets me some fresh air. It gets my mind going. It gets my body going. I come in, I sit down and I've got some energy. You know, it doesn't sound like I just woke up from a nap, let's say. We don't ever want to sound like we just woke up from a nap, even if we have. So it's important to kind of prime our bodies and our minds for what's ahead of us. And moving is a good way to do that. Um, so that's one thing. And then, of course, there's the external environment that you're in, the office that you're in, whatever that means for you at your home or wherever you are, to have a quiet environment free of distractions, free of background noise. Um, I know when I first started lecturing in the spring, I had a chair that was squeaky. And I never realized how squeaky it was 
until I started listening back to some of my recordings. And every time I moved, there was a squeak in the chair uh, and it started to distract me. And I'm sure it was distracting to the listener, uh, to my students. And so, you know, having the right chair that's comfortable, that you can sit up, um, be supported, um, you know, move a little closer to the monitor so you feel like you're being connected to people. Um, and then the other thing I think is really helpful, I oftentimes ask my students if they're comfortable to leave their video feed on. Um, and the reason I like that is because I feel more connected to the people that I'm speaking to, you know, rather than just looking at a black screen, if you will, uh, or just, you know, sound like I'm reading off a teleprompter from my slides. If I can see somebody's face, see a couple of students' faces, I feel connected, I feel a little more energized, and also I can read their faces and see whether or not I'm really connecting. If it looks like they're nodding off or looking off, I know that, you know, hey, maybe my voice is trailing off. Uh, maybe I need to kind of, you know, step up my energy level a little bit. Um, so it's important to do that. And then we also take breaks. I was teaching a class on Tuesday evenings that was four hours once a week. And there was no way I could talk for four hours. Uh, I mean, I love to talk. I could talk for four hours, but my voice wouldn't hold up for four hours. So, you know, I built in some breaks uh, for them and for me. And during those breaks, I was drinking water and, you know, trying to just conserve my voice as much as I could. So, you know, the online can be very effective. And the idea is to try to replicate as much of the, you know, internal and external environment that you would have in the classroom at home or wherever it is that you're lecturing from. Great. That's awesome. Um, thank you so much, Richard, for giving of your time. Uh, to share with our TopCast listeners, especially our faculty, but also folks who are working closely with faculty, like instructional designers, to hear some things to keep in mind, to, to preserve our voice regardless, whether it's online, face-to-face, -face, some kind of a, a blend of the two. Anything, just as a parting comment, can I just ask you, if something really is going wrong, right, at what point, if you're like, oh, man, something doesn't feel right or it doesn't sound right, at what point do you seek help and... Where do you seek that help? Um, and uh, to use your metaphor, um, our gas tank of time is 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 about to uh, to run out. But just a, I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't address that somehow with uh, for our listeners. Well, thank you for asking that, Kelvin, because I think that's a very important question. One of the things that you have to think about is when do you know to go for help? So what I usually tell people is these are the things that you want to be aware of. Number one, is there any pain in producing the voice? Do you feel pain or strain in the throat? Um, so that's number one. Pain can be a sign of you know, something simple going wrong or something more severe going wrong. So pain is never a good thing when you're producing your voice, whether you're speaking or singing. The second thing is the change in the quality of your voice. So if you hear your voice go from what mine sounds like now to more like this, you know, one, two, three, four, where you get kind of a hoarse, raspy, kind of breathy, strained voice, that's another sign that there's potentially a reason to be evaluated. If you have a voice and you feel tightness in your throat, so it's kind of a strained voice like this where you're really having to push your voice out and you feel that sensation of strain, that again is not a normal sensation that one should have. So strain, pain, any kind of extra effort, fatigue, if you're like, wow, you know, at the end of that lecture, I am exhausted. You know, I'm ready to go take a nap after a 30 minute presentation. That can be a sign that you're overusing or misusing your voice. And in particular, if any of those things last more than two weeks, that can potentially be a problem. So we're all gonna have some form of, you know, laryngitis. We're all gonna have some form of vocal strain just because of life as it is right now. But if it's a persistent problem, meaning two weeks or more, the best thing to do is to see your physician and potentially get a referral to an ear, nose, and throat specialist. We have some excellent ones here in Orlando. Um, and most likely, that ear, nose, and throat specialist will refer you to a speech-language pathologist like myself, who specializes in voice. And then you would come in for a referral, and we would talk about many of the things that you and I have been talking about today. Uh, we talk about vocal hygiene and some things that you can do at home to help preserve your voice. Talk about vocal warm-ups, 
and cool downs and other things that one can do to help make their voice last longer. And most people do very well in voice therapy. It's typically a short process of, you know, once or twice a week for four or five weeks. Um, and people can get past those issues when it's really an issue of overuse or misuse of the voice. So there's a lot that can be done. And if you're a faculty member at a university that has a department of communication sciences and disorders like we do, they're going to have a speech and hearing clinic and you can get a referral there or self-refer to the speech and hearing clinic and, and have resources right there on your campus to get help. Those are excellent, uh, excellent tips and great pro advice. And, and thank you so much, Richard, for coming and, and offering your expertise uh, applied to this specific uh, context that we're in uh, of teaching in a lot of flux and, uh, and speaking all the time in a lot of different modalities. And uh, I am positive that our listeners are going to appreciate that um, and uh, know where to go if they have some, some difficulties. So thank you so much for giving of your time today. You're welcome. I appreciate you helping me give voice to this very important issue. Well, Kelvin, that was your interview with Dr. Richard Zrake. I thought that, uh, I thought he had a lot of really interesting insights. Yeah, smart guy, knows a lot, experienced. I mean, I think he could have probably talked for a long time about this topic, obviously. Well, it's his, it's his profession. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he is the expert. Yeah, that's right. But you did mention before we went to the interview how you thought this would be a good companion to the to our last episode about mm -hmm. blend flex, and mm -hmm. you know maybe maybe this would be a good opportunity to kind of you know make that connection a little more mm -hmm. explicit. Mm -hmm. So just to re recap for for our listeners, uh, without going into the detail, if you want to know the detail, listen to our prior episode number seventy one, I think mm -hmm. it is about blend flex. Um, but that is a it's kind of a derivation of high flex where students will uh, participate in the class both in class and remotely and um, and some of the best practices around that and um, it, it's going to put a particular strain on faculty not just in pedagogy but actually mm -hmm. with their voice mm -hmm. and it's not even something that I had thought about yeah. because they you know Richard talked about moving around a lot and how that can help um, and for example faculty in a blend flex environment are going to be somewhat tethered to about yeah. a five or six foot radius behind the podium yeah. for two reasons. One, because that's where the camera is for the remote students so they can see them, but also where the microphone is going to be mm -hmm. uh, so that the remote students can hear them. And then the second thing I thought about as I was listening to him was um, speaking through a mask mm -hmm. all day long in a classroom. Yeah. And um, I know just wearing it when I wear it around, um, it it can be um, it can be a bit of a of a hassle, and I mm -hmm. and sometimes you have to project a little more loudly. I like mm -hmm. if I order something at a like at a restaurant, like a takeout or something. I, I went got a sandwich yesterday, and I had to repeat my order mm -hmm. for the. I had to lean forward so that the the cashier could hear what I was saying through my mask. Yeah. So I can imagine what a classroom is going to be like. Yeah, I thought some of the. I think you're right. I think those are challenges, and I think. For me, I was think as I listened again to the interview, I think some of the stuff that he said about the online preparation, I thought was was good that probably you should redouble your efforts in that blend flex setting. You know, since you can't walk around also for social distancing, right? And since you're going to be kind of distant, you might not have room amplification. I mean, warming up your voice, doing that walking around the block thing, um, definitely standing and not you know, falling victim to kind of sitting at the lectern or something, uh, staying energized, getting a good breath, maybe even taking some, a couple of really good deep breaths before you even start, because it's all that, it's vocalized breath is really all, all that we're really talking about here. I think maybe hydrate good. I think those are probably things that would help with the with the face-to-face -face and the blend flex, I think, based yeah, on what he said. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, as obvious as it sounds and as simple as it sounds, I really do think that I'm no physiologist, but that, that hydration is, mm -hmm. is non-trivial. Staying hydrated all day long. I mean, we, we know that's just good for you in general, but um, especially for this environment. And, and then you alluded to this, I believe, but um, I think it's something everybody's dealing with, even if they're not teaching, mm -hmm. that we're all on Zoom or mm, the equivalent something. all day long. It seems mm -hmm. like I'm on Skype, Teams, and Zoom. All day. Constantly. Like, yeah, it seems you. like a general rotation between those three <laughs> platforms. 
I, I feel like I talk more now than I did when we were all in the same room together. Yeah. So I, I've actually sort of felt that myself. Um, and uh, I, we probably need to drink something besides coffee. Yeah, uh, right. You know, That's right. I got my I got my water here mm-hmm. that I keep mm-hmm. refilling. Uh, fortunately, we have nice filtered water fountains here in our new facility. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can go out and refill, save yeah. the environment. Yeah. No, I totally agree with that. In fact, um, I'll see if we either from Richard or elsewhere, we'll put in the show notes some um, uh, some tips on hydration. But you want to cool. uh, you want am I um, am I going to try to land this plane, Tom? Why don't you put a bow on this plane and then land it? <laughs> I'll bring in the bow for a landing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would say as long as there are instructors, there will be at least some use of the physical voice in teaching, whether face-to-face or online. So knowing how to avoid vocal misuse and to properly care for one's voice is an often overlooked but very important part of teaching. Would you agree? Yeah, I totally agree. No matter how much you know, if you can't communicate that effectively because your voice is under strain, then you won't be as effective, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) It's pretty obvious, right? Mm -hmm. So um, maybe I'll do one quick plug that Mm -hmm. if you enjoy listening to TopCast, please consider leaving us a starred review or starred rating, right, in the mm-hmm. podcast of your choice or a re- written review, mm-hmm. um, even like a one-sentence recommendation on your podcast platform of choice can uh, really help the algorithm and help people mm-hmm. find content like this. Yeah, 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 yeah that's great. I, I, Yes, what you said, go do that. <laughs> Especially do that. if it was Apple Podcasts because we have a lot of folks who find us on Apple Podcasts, but wherever, yep. if you're listening on Spotify or whatever, iHeartRadio, wherever, you know. We we'll, are we'll take everywhere, it. actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even Alexa. I've played us on Alexa. <laughs> yeah, she's cool. <laughs> you just have it on con- continual repeat, do you? That's right, yeah. Yeah, my wife leaves the room. But yes, yeah. <laughs> the, the, no wonder the data are going up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe on that note, it's a, it's a good note to, to end on. So until next time, for TopCast, I am Tom. I'm Kelvin. See ya. So if you ask me if I'm a coffee drinker, I would tell you, no, I'm not really a coffee drinker. The closest thing I have to coffee in my house is teenagers. Why are teenagers the closest thing to coffee? Because they're both grounded. <laughs>